Hello and welcome to Practical ECG Courses. My name is Obed and I am an emergency physician working in the UK. I teach a concept-based approach to ECGs. If you are interested in knowing more, please check out my website or my YouTube channel. I will leave the links in the description box below. The ECG which I will be covering today is a tachyarrhythmia. It is a very important one for ED clinicians, especially because it is prone to misinterpretation with immediate and very dangerous consequences. It is even more relevant than ever before because it is not mentioned in the latest 2021 ALS tachycardia algorithm. I will show you three ECGs. In all three cases, the ECG was misinterpreted by senior ED clinicians in research. All three are true stories which happened within the NHS. After discussing each ECG, I will tell you what actually happened with these patients. There are a lot of learning points which we will discuss towards the end. This was the scenario for the first patient. During a late shift in ED, just before the night team comes in, a 35-year-old male is wheeled into recess, complaining of chest discomfort and palpitations. He is hemodynamically stable. This is an ECG I have taken off the internet. This is very similar to the original ECG and it will serve our purpose for today. The original ECG was of a lower quality and had a lot of pen markings over it. Pause the video, take a good look at the ECG and come to your diagnosis. Also decide how you are going to treat the patient. If you cannot diagnose it, we will see if we can use a concept based approach to solve the ECG and to determine the appropriate treatment. Normally, I would follow the default systematic approach for any ECG interpretation, that is rate, rhythm, axis, deflections, intervals, etc. But for arrhythmias, I use a separate systematic approach which enables a rapid diagnosis of most arrhythmias. That is a separate talk by itself and I will be talking about it during my teaching session on tachyarrhythmias in July. Let me talk through how I interpret this ECG. The very first thing that I notice when I see this ECG is that there are simply too many complexes. That tells me that there is a tachycardia involved. Looking at the rhythm strip, it is evident that the rhythm is irregularly irregular. To calculate the rate of an irregular rhythm, you need to know how many QRS complexes are occurring in 30 large boxes. In this case, it is 22. So that means that there are 22 QRS complexes in 6 seconds. So if I multiply that by 10, I have 220 QRS complexes in 60 seconds. So the heart rate in this patient is 220 per minute. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of an irregularly irregular tachycardia? The most common cause is AF, atrial fibrillation. Before we move further, let's have a quick review of some important concepts which will help us analyze the ECG further. The first concept that you should know is that the atria and the ventricles are separated from each other by an electrically inert conduction barrier formed by the fibrous AV ring. For any impulse to travel across this barrier, it has to travel through the AV node and the bundle of His into the ventricles. Normally, there is no other way for an impulse to travel from the atria to the ventricles other than this conduction system. The second concept that you should be aware of is the difference between atrial and ventricular depolarization. Normally, the SA node spontaneously depolarizes and produces an impulse. Because the SA node is located in the right atria, the right atria depolarizes first, followed by the depolarization of the left atria. This is referred to as sequential depolarization. In contrast, when the impulse leaves the AV node and enters the bundle of His, it almost instantaneously reaches both sides of the ventricle, resulting in a simultaneous depolarization of both sides of the ventricle. That's, that is to say that ventricular depolarization is simultaneous. The third concept you should be aware of is how the velocity of impulse conduction differs across different types of tissues. The conduction system of the heart, that is the his Purkinje system, is specialized for conducting impulses and therefore transmits impulses at the fastest rates. In contrast, the myocardial tissue is specialized for contraction 
but it can also transmit impulses but at a much lower rate. So when ventricular depolarization occurs because of impulses transmitted through the conduction system, the QRS will be narrow as it takes the least amount of time. Whereas when ventricular depolarization occurs because of impulses transmitted through the myocardium, the QRS will be much wider as it takes a lot more time to complete the ventricular depolarization. The fourth concept that you should know is that when the ventricle gets depolarized by a single impulse coming down the bundle of his, it travels across the ventricles through a particular route and this causes the ventricular depolarization to occur in a particular manner. This is repeated for every beat and so the morphology of the QRS always remains the same. But what happens if the ventricles are getting depolarized in a different manner? Obviously, the QRS morphology will change. Now, let's consider what happens in AF. In AF, instead of having a single impulse produced by the SA node, there are multiple foci producing around 300 to 600 impulses. These 600 impulses compete to depolarize the atria, but it cannot. So instead of an organized atrial contraction, the atria fibrillates and hence the name atrial fibrillation. Now I want you to think about the rate of the fastest AF that you have seen so far. The fastest rates that you will have seen will be somewhere in the range of 180 to 200, never more than 200. Now this raises two questions. Why is it that you cannot have an AF with a rate more than 200? And there were 600 atrial impulses, but less than 200 impulses reached the ventricles. So what happened to the remaining 400 or so impulses? In AF, 600 impulses bombard the AV node. The AV node knows that if it transmits all the 600 atrial impulses, the ventricles will be unable to contract and will start fibrillating. In other words, the patient will develop ventricular fibrillation or VF. So whenever there are too many atrial impulses trying to cross the AV node, the AV node becomes more refractory and blocks out most of the impulses. As a result, less than 200 of the 600 impulses ends up reaching the ventricles. This property of the AV node by which it can increase its own refractoriness when faced with too many supraventricular impulses is known as decremental conduction. So what would you expect to see on the ECG in AF? As the 600 atrial impulses causes the atria to fibrillate instead of having an organized atrial contraction, there is an absence of discrete P waves seen on the ECG. Instead, the atrial activity is seen on the ECG as rapid low amplitude fibrillatory waves. Also remember that the 600 atrial impulses are produced by the <laughs> atria very randomly or chaotically. And since the AV node randomly blocks out 400 impulses, the remaining impulses reaches the ventricles in a very random and irregular manner as well. And this causes the ventricles to contract very irregularly. So ultimately, what you get in AF is a very irregularly irregular rhythm. These are the two diagnostic criteria for AF an irregularly irregular rhythm and the absence of a discrete P wave. In addition, there are two more points that you need to remember about AF. The maximum rate of AF is always less than 200. This is because of the decremental conduction of the AV node. And the QRS complexes are usually narrow as the impulses are traveling down rapidly through the specialized conduction tissue and both sides of the ventricles are getting depolarized simultaneously. Now let's go back to our ECG. So could this be AF? This ECG shows an irregularly irregular tachycardia without any discrete P waves anywhere on the ECG. As it satisfies both the diagnostic criteria of AF, it could be AF. But we also spoke of two additional features of AF. We said that AF usually has a narrow QRS complex. In this ECG, you can see that there are a lot of wide QRS complexes. Also, if you look at the rate, it is 220. 220 is the average rate. 
if you look at the individual complexes, you can see that there are some places where the rates are so fast that the RR interval is just under one large square. This means that the rate in these places can be as high as 375, which is far more than the maximum of 200 beats expected in an isolated AF. So to summarize, while this ECG fulfills the diagnostic criteria for AF, it does not behave like an usual AF. It is wide and it has rates much faster than 200. So how can you explain this? Suppose I tell you that our patient's ECG was in fact AF, then how would you be able to explain the ventricular rates going beyond 200? We know that the AV node can only conduct impulses at a rate of less than 200. The only way rates of more than 200 is possible is if there is an additional pathway which is permitting the impulses to travel from the atria into the ventricles. This is referred to as an accessory pathway. If the accessory pathway connects the atria directly into the ventricle, it is referred to as the bundle of Kent, which tells us that the patient also has a WPW in addition to the AF. So in patients with AF with WPW, there are two pathways which can transmit impulses from the atria into the ventricles. The first is the normal AV node bundle of his pathway and the second is the abnormal accessory pathway. There is an important difference between the conduction across these two pathways. The AV node delays the transmission of impulse across it whereas accessory pathway does not cause any delay in the transmission of impulse across it. Accessory pathways usually permits a free transmission of impulses without any delay. Now let us look at how the pathophysiology of AF changes when there is an accessory pathway connecting the atria to the ventricles. Let us start with the rate. Previously in isolated AF, the heart rate was limited to 200. But now that there is an accessory pathway which allows a free transmission of impulses, more impulses can travel down into the ventricles. And so the ventricular rate is more than 200. What about the rhythm? As the baseline rhythm is irregularly irregular, because of the AF, it still continues to be irregularly irregular. The presence of the accessory pathway primarily affects ventricular depolarization. And so on ECG, we would expect the QRS to be affected. So let us look at the changes in the QRS now. In isolated AF, all the impulses travel to the ventricles using the same pathway and causes the depolarization to occur in the same manner each time. So they have the same QRS morphology throughout. But in AF with WPW, the impulses comes down both pathways randomly and this causes the ventricles to depolarize in a different manner each time. So what happens to the QRS morphology? There will be a beat-to-beat -beat variability in QRS morphology. The impulses coming down the accessory pathway is directly transmitted into the ventricular myocardium and further transmission also occurs via the myocardium, which is a very slow mode of conduction. And so the ventricular depolarization takes more time. This is reflected on the ECG as a wide QRS. The higher the degree of ventricular depolarization occurring due to the impulse coming down the accessory pathway, the wider the QRS. So in AF with WPW, there are four things you would expect to see. A ventricular rate more than 200, an irregularly regular rhythm, a variable QRS morphology, and wide QRS complexes. These are the four criteria of AF with WPW. Now let's check if this ECG fulfills the criteria for AF with WPW. A rate of more than 200. As discussed earlier, you can see that the rate here is almost 375. An important point that I want to emphasize here is that when calculating the rate, the important thing is to look for any two QRS complexes which shows a rate faster than 200. You can see that here in many places. In this ECG, when we calculated the heart rate, it had come up to 220. That may not always be the case. Sometimes you can have an overall heart rate of less than 200, but parts of the ECG may show rates of more than 200. If this happens, consider the possibility of AF with WPW and look at other criteria. An irregularly irregular rhythm. I think that is very evident in the rhythm strip. For the third and the fourth criteria, again simply look at the long rhythm strip at the bottom. 
you can see the QRS has varying morphologies and that the QRS is also wide. So I think it would be reasonable to assume that the diagnosis here is AF with WPW. Now why is AF with WPW relevant in the ED? I think the more important question is what makes AF with WPW dangerous or rather why is the misinterpretation of AF with WPW particularly dangerous? What are the common drugs used to treat tachyarrhythmias in the ED? Adenosine, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin. All these drugs are AV nodal blockers. Remember, the decremental conduction property of the AV node along with the rapid transmission of impulses via the his Purkinje system is what protects the ventricles from the 600 atrial impulses in patients with AF with WPW. What would happen if we administered any of these drugs to a patient with AF with WPW? They will block the AV node. As a result, all the 600 atrial impulses can now freely go down the accessory pathway into the ventricles without any competition from the impulses coming down the normal conduction pathway. But since the ventricles cannot depolarize 600 times, it begins to fibrillate, which is referred to as ventricular fibrillation OVF. In short, by giving the AV blockers, the AF is now converted into a VF. So these drugs are contraindicated in AF with WPW. So the greatest danger with the misinterpretation of AF with WPW ECG is that it will cause us to administer drugs which can cause a VF cardiac arrest. So how do we treat AF with WPW? As with most tachyarrhythmias, if the patient is unstable, the treatment is electricity. But if the patient is stable, then this is where things get slightly controversial. The treatment actually differs from country to country. Ideally, AF with WPW should be treated with drugs that does not have the ability to block the AV node. As per the 2014 AHA ACC guidelines, that is the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guidelines, which is still in force, the preferred drug is IV procainamide as it can terminate AF in WPW patients without involving the AV node. Ibutrilide is also another reasonably good option. But as per my understanding, both these drugs are not available to us in the UK. In the UK, the drug recommended to treat AF with WPW in the ED is amiodarone. Amiodarone is generally a very good and safe drug, but there is a problem with using amiodarone in AF with WPW. While amiodarone is primarily a class 3 antiarrhythmic, it also has class 1, 2 and 4 activity which means that it also has beta blocking and calcium channel blocking effects, which is not desirable in a patient with AF with WPW, which is why amiodarone is also on the list of drugs contraindicated in AF with WPW in the US as well as in many other countries. Like I said, this is a controversial topic with differences in practice depending upon where you practice emergency medicine. I subscribe to a school of thought where it is safer to electrically cardioward even a stable patient over administration of amiodarone. If the patient did not revert with amiodarone, what would you do? You would cardioward the patient electrically. This way, you go directly to the definitive treatment without the potential risks posed by amiodarone. This is what I practiced back in India and was the local policy and I have found it to be very effective. If you want to administer synchronized cardioversion, have a chat with the ED consultant and cardiology and if both are happy, go for it. If not, I strongly recommend you follow whatever your local policy is. So what actually happened with our first patient? To recap, it was a 35 year old male who was wheeled into recess just before handover with a history of chest discomfort and palpitations and was hemodynamically stable. The ED registrar who saw this ECG interpreted it as stable polymorphic VT with pulse. He showed the ECG to an ED consultant who also agreed that this was a VT and the patient was started on amiodarone as per protocol for stable VT. The patient was then handed over to the night team who had come in by then. The night ED registrar saw this ECG and felt that it was AF with RBBB. He showed the ECG to a medical registrar who was in recess at the time and the medical reg also felt that it was an AF with RBBB. By this time, the dose of amiodarone 300 mg was completed, but the tachyarrhythmia was still ongoing. 
So the medical registrar suggested giving an IV beta block to slow down the rhythm. And so an IV beta blocker was administered and you can guess what happened immediately afterwards. The patient went into cardiac arrest and what was the initial rhythm? It was VF. So they immediately shocked the patient and the patient achieved ROSC instantly. At this point, both the ED registrar and the medical registrar are thinking that this is actually a VT which deteriorated suddenly and not an AF with RBBB as they had previously thought. None of the four senior clinicians who have seen the ECG have considered AF with WPW so far. Sometime later, the night ED registrar sent a message to the evening ED registrar who had handed him the patient, informing him that the patient had arrested. And the evening registrar, who is a close friend of mine, sent me the ECG asking for my opinion at around midnight. And this is how I was involved in this case. I informed him that it was an AF with WPW and then things went back on track from there. Interestingly, this ECG was then discussed with multiple senior ED clinicians over the next couple of days, but except one person, nobody made the correct diagnosis. This incident happened in a trust far away from my workplace, but there are quite a few important learning points which is applicable to all of us. AF with WPW ECG is a must know for all ED clinicians, especially senior decision makers. Most ED clinicians are already aware of AF with WPW and the drugs contraindicated in it. But when they see the actual ECG in clinical practice, it is often misinterpreted. The most common misinterpretation being AF with a bundle branch block. I will show you two more ECGs where exactly the same thing happened. Interestingly, all the three incidents happened within a span of six months from the first patient. Consequences of misinterpretation of AF with WPW is often a VF cardiac arrest, as most of the drugs usually given in tachyarrhythmias are contraindicated in AF with WPW. This is what makes it the most dangerous mistake in the ECG interpretation of tachyarrhythmias in the ED. When AF with WPW is misinterpreted, a stable patient is more at risk than an unstable patient. An unstable patient will receive electricity even if the ECG is misinterpreted, which is still the right treatment. But when an AF with WPW is misinterpreted in a stable patient, the drugs given subsequently are usually contraindicated and puts the patient at a very high risk of a cardiac arrest. Even in our patient, he received the inappropriate treatment while he was stable and the right treatment when he was unstable. DDs for an irregular broad complex tachycardia. We will discuss that in the next slide. ECGs should always be independently interpreted. Hearing someone else's interpretation often anchors us to their conclusions. This was seen twice in this case. First by the ED consultant who agreed that it was a VT and then by the medical registrar who agreed that, agreed that it was an AF with RBBB. So always interpret all ECGs by yourselves. There are three DDs for an irregular broad complex tachycardia, polymorphic VT, AF with bundle branch block and AF with WPW. So why is this not polymorphic VT? After all, it is an irregularly irregular broad complex tachycardia with QRS of differing morphologies. In AF with WPW, there are two pathways by which impulses can travel from the atria into the ventricles. Irrespective of the pathway being used, the ventricular depolarization vector is always going in the same direction. Therefore, the axis is usually stable. Now what happens in a polymorphic VT? In polymorphic VT, the depolarization vectors goes in different directions depending upon where the ectopic foci is. For example, this goes here, this goes this way, this goes this way, and this goes this way. So as you can see, the axis keeps changing frequently. So the stability of the axis can be used to differentiate between AF with WPW and polymorphic VT. The stability of the axis is looked for in the rhythm strip. Now how do you look for the axis in a single lead rhythm strip? Simply look for the direction in which the pointy bit of the QRS is facing. In the first complex, you can see that the pointy bit is facing upwards. So the axis is upwards in that bit. Similarly, look at all the complexes in the rhythm strip. You can see that all the complexes have the pointy bit upwards. That means all these complexes have the electrical axis facing the same way in, within the same lead. 
this tells us that the axis is stable throughout the lead and that this is AF with WPW. Now let us look at the rhythm strip of polymorphic VT. As you can see here, the axis keeps changing. Here you can see that the pointy bits is all upwards, whereas here you can see the pointy bit is all downwards. And here again you can see the pointy bit is all upwards. So as you can see, the axis keeps changing in polymorphic VT. So the axis is a point of differentiation between AF with WPW and polymorphic VT. If the axis is stable throughout, it is suggestive of AF with WPW. And if the axis keeps changing, it is suggestive of polymorphic VT. So why is this not AF with RBBB? Actually, differentiating AF with WPW from AF with RBBB or LBBB is actually quite simple. You just need to remember that the uniqueness of findings of AF with WPW on ECG arises from the accessory pathway because the accessory pathway enables a rate more than 200 and variable QRS morphologies, as you can see here in the rhythm strip. But since AF with bundle branch block has only one pathway in which the impulses can travel from the atria into the ventricles, the rates are always less than 200 and the QRS morphology should be the same throughout the ECG, as you can see here. So to summarize, if you have a rate more than 200 and varying QRS morphologies, it is suggestive of AF with WPW. Whereas, if you have a rate less than 200 and a uniform QRS morphology, that is suggestive of AF with bundle branch block. This is an ECG of AF with LBBB, not the monomorphic QRS complexes throughout the ECG, and the fastest rates is less than 200. So that makes this AF with LBBB. An irregularly irregular broad complex tachycardia with QRS of varying morphologies and changing axis in the rhythm strip makes this a polymorphic VT. The next patient is a 40 year old male who was sat upon a recess bed chatting. He had come in with complaints of palpitations but no chest pain and he was hemodynamically stable. This ECG shows an irregularly irregular broad complex tachyarrhythmia with varying QRS morphologies. There is no rhythm strip, but the axis is stable in all the 12 leads of the ECG. And that makes this an AF with WPW. I hope that was simple. Now, what actually happened in this case? This ECG was misinterpreted as AF with right bundle branch block. And the first dose of IV beta blockers was administered unsuccessfully. I happened to be walking by the recess when I noticed the rhythm on the monitor and went to check out the ECG which is a bad habit of mine. While looking through the ECG, the clinician was actually loading up the next dose of beta blockers. I expressed my concerns, but the clinician was not convinced. So we got a cardiology opinion who agreed with my interpretation. And so a synchronized cardioversion was done for this patient. This is the post cardioversion ECG. You can see the short PR interval, the delta wave and the white QRS in multiple leads. So it confirms the diagnosis of AF with WPW. Luckily, this patient did not suffer harm because of treatment with beta blockers, unlike the first patient who had arrested immediately on being administered beta blockers. But if a second dose had been administered, it is quite likely that this patient also would have had a cardiac arrest. Either way, this case reinforces the fact that stable patients are more at risk when AF with WPW is misinterpreted compared to unstable patients. The third patient was an 85 year old male diagnosed with lung sepsis and was in recess waiting for a bed under medics. He was tachycardic and tachypneic. BP was slightly on the lower side but within the normal range. He had a past history of LBBB in addition to multiple other comorbidities. This is an irregularly irregular broad complex tachycardia with varying QRS morphologies probably best appreciated in the rhythm strip of V1. At quite a few places, the rates are higher than 200, the highest being 250. You can also see that the axis is stable in the rhythm strip. Considering all this, the patient has an AF with WPW. Now, what happened with this patient? This ECG was misinterpreted as AF with LBBB and the patient was administered digoxin. 
The surprising thing in this case was that this was misinterpreted by both the senior a &E clinician as well as by the cardiology reg. In fact, the cardiology reg had documented the diagnosis of AF with RBBB with advice to administer digoxin regularly in the notes. I think the pre-existing LBBB as well as the fact that the findings are a little bit more subtle in this case may have contributed to the misinterpretation. But if you looked for it, the findings of AF with WPW is clearly present. Due to the poor functional baseline of the patient and the multiple comorbidities, this patient was categorized as a DNA-CPR patient and subsequently expired within the next 48 hours. What do you do when faced with an tachyarrhythmic patient in recess? You open up the ALS tachycardia algorithm. This is the latest tachycardia algorithm. Let's zoom in on the relevant area. If you go to the irregular broad complex tachycardia section of this algorithm, you will see that there are only two possibilities. Either it is an AF with a bundle branch block or a polymorphic VT. If you diagnose an AF with a bundle branch block, you are then directed to this section where they tell you to administer a beta blocker or a digoxin, both of which are contraindicated in AF with WPW. I think this is a problem with real life implications because this algorithm kind of makes you choose between either of these two options. They do mention in the textbook that AF with WPW is a possibility, but nobody reads an ALS textbook in recess. The fact that AF with WPW is missing from this list is probably one of the reasons why AF with WPW is being misinterpreted so often. As the treatment of AF with WPW is unique, with contraindication to multiple antiarrhythmic drugs routinely used in the ED, I think it definitely deserves a mention on this list. I really hope that they will incorporate AF with WPW in the next algorithm and not just in the textbook. Till then, remember that there is a third differential diagnosis on this list. Surprisingly, if you look at the 2015 tachycardia algorithm, you will see that pre-excited AF or AF with WPW is on this list, but polymorphic VT is again missing here. Even more surprising is the fact that all the three DDs were clearly mentioned in the 2010 version of the tachycardia algorithm. Makes you wonder why they changed it in the 2015 and the 2021 guidelines. AF with WPW is an example of the perfect storm. Multiple seemingly minor factors all working together in perfect synchrony to create poor outcomes. Often clinicians are not aware that isolated AF does not exceed 200 beats per minute. And so they do not actively look for the fastest rates of AF, which would have been the first clue to considering AF with WPW. AF with WPW is less commoner than the other DDs of irregular broad complex tachycardias. Actually, AF with bundle branch blocks are much more common. There is an inherent urgency to act immediately because of the very high rates in AF with WPW. Most of the routine antiarrhythmic drugs are contraindicated in AF with WPW. In fact, the only drug that we can use in ANEs in UK is actually contraindicated in some other countries. The 2021 ALS tachycardia algorithm does not specifically mention AF with WPW as a cause of irregular broad complex tachycardia. Misinterpret the ECG and administer a drug and you get a cardiac arrest almost immediately. How often does that actually happen? The only way to avoid this perfect storm is to be aware of AF with WPW and how to look for it. If you found this video useful, please share it with your colleagues. Who knows, maybe it will help save a life. Let's quickly recap all that we have covered today. We have covered the pathophysiology of isolated AF and how it changes in AF with WPW. We have also looked at the clinical relevance of AF with WPW and how misinterpretation of AF with WPW can cause BF. We have also covered the criteria, the DDs, and how to differentiate between the different DDs of AF with WPW. We have also had a look at the 2021 tachycardia algorithm, which is incomplete with regards to the DDs of irregular broad complex tachycardias. I know we have covered a lot of concepts and points today. But if there is only one point you are going to take away from this talk, let it be this. Whenever you see an AF, make a habit of looking for the fastest rate. 
An isolated AF should never have a rate of more than 200. And with that, we are done with today's session. Thank you for listening to my talk. If you found this useful, please like the video and consider subscribing. If you would like to know more about my concept-based ECG teaching sessions, please check out my website at www.practicalecgcourses.com. I will leave a link in the description box below. Thank you for listening and bye-bye for now.